mean God has a definite plan for your life? Can I hear a loud amen? amen? And it's a plan of good things, not a plan of failure. A lot of people think what will be will be, so whatever God wants. No, God wants you to be a victorious person. Amen. God wants you to succeed. Amen. Can I hear a loud amen? amen? The good thing is that God wants your participation as well. This is where the limitation comes in. God has done some things for us in Christ Jesus. Say amen. A lot of things actually. But the Holy Ghost is also doing things in us as a result of what God has done for us in Christ. So we need to cooperate. We need to participate. We need to let the provision become an experiential reality. And I hear loud amen. So today we're looking at the believer's anointing. Hallelujah. In other words, the believer is anointed. Amen. And we want to study the believer's anointing and trust God that he will grant utterance, understanding, and uh, all of that. Now, as usual, I think something has happened to my iPad. But well, God will help me. Say amen. Let's turn our Bibles to Isaiah 61. And let's look at that scripture that Jesus quoted in Luke chapter 4 when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Hallelujah. So I want to start from there and see how far we can go today. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. I like that word. We're talking about the believer's anointing, so we want to understand anointing. Amen? All right. So, it says, Amplified Translation says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed and qualified me to preach the gospel of good tidings to the meek, the poor, and afflicted. He has sent me to bind up and to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the physical and spiritual captives, and the opening of the prison and of the eyes of those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of his favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant consolation and joy to those who mourn in Zion, to give them an ornament or garland or diadem of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a heavy burdened and failing spirit, that they may be called the oaks of righteousness, lofty, strong, and magnificent, distinguished for uprightness, justice, and right standing with God, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Can I hear loud? Amen. amen. Those are profound scriptures, isn't it? That the, this, the prophet Isaiah picked it up in the spirit, and he began to release those words, that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And if you turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, I think verse 18, Jesus opened this very place, and he began to... Read, is it 18 or 16? Let me look for it. Right. In verse 16, it says, So when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and he entered the synagogue as it was his custom on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And there was handed to him the roll of the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened the, uh, the, the book and found the place where it was written. So Jesus deliberately looked for that place where we first read, and he read it. He left out some parts. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. I want you to take note of the word anointed. Because that word is the reason why we're studying this today. The word anointed, anointing. Say amen. Anointed one, the Messiah, to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To send forth as delivered those who were oppressed, who were downtrodden, bruised, crushed, broken down by calamity. To proclaim the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and free favors of God profusely abound. Then he rolled up the book and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were gazing attentively at him and he began to speak to them. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled while you are present and hearing. Say amen. How many of you think they thought so? I mean, somebody comes up and, and, and reads an Old Testament scripture 
And he says, today it's been fulfilled. And he sits down. He says, it's fulfilled. And they are thinking, you must be crazy. Why? You must understand a few things about the history of the land and of, of Israel and what the word anointing means to them. Because it doesn't mean the same thing to us like it meant to them. So I just want to take you through that very quickly without quoting too many scriptures. Everyone who did something for God was anointed to do it in the Old Testament. You must understand that. God is not the kind of God that anybody can just do anything for him. He always wanted, especially after he instituted the laws of Moses, he made sure that the uh, priest was anointed. And the word anointing just means to rub off on. It's like they use oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So they pour the oil to anoint. And another word they used was consecrate. In other words, when you are a priest in the Old Testament, they anoint you. They anoint even your garments. They even anoint the tent where they meet. I mean, everything was sacred. And because of that, the anointing oil was particularly made in a particular fashion. He gave them the details of how they should do it. But the point we're making here is that anything that they did in the Old Testament, the priests, the prophet, the kings, say amen, they were all anointed. So in the days of Moses, the priests were anointed. When time went on and they started having kings, remember Saul, Samuel anointed Saul to be king, say amen. David was anointed king before he confronted Goliath. So one thing you must understand is that in their minds, anointing and the anointed one was designed in their history to come and deliver them from their enemies. Amen. That's why they will ask John the Baptist, are you the one to come? So they were expecting. Is that not true? Are you the one to come? Why were they saying that? Because they were expecting deliverance and they knew that God uses human beings that he has rubbed his spirit upon to bring deliverance. Case in point, Samson. I mean, if you know the story of Samson. We didn't read that Samson was anointed with oil, but from his mother's womb, he was told, the mother was told, he will be a Nazarite. That is found in Judges between chapters 13 and 16. He will be a Nazarite. In other words, he will be consecrated to be used of God to accomplish deliverance. Am I talking here? This is what led to the clergy laity divide. Because people in the New Testament now think that the clergy are the anointed ones, the laity are not the anointed ones. That's what I want to knock off today. Can I hear an amen? Because my wife shared a lot of things in the sharing she's been sharing with us. And she brought out the gifts of the spirit, the charismatic gift, the motive gift. So brilliantly, I want to recommend the series that she's done. Say amen. That we all should take it because it will help you understand what I'm saying now. Say loud amen. So what I'm bringing up is this. In the mind of a Jew, the word anointing implies consecration. And the anointed one is the one who is designed to bring deliverance from their physical enemies. Am I making sense? Yeah. So if you can understand that, you will appreciate a whole lot of things. And the scriptures you can quote, uh, you can write down. Exodus 29, verses 7 and 21. I don't want us to go there. <laughs> And Exodus 30, 25 to 31, it's talking about an Aaron being anointed. Say amen. In Leviticus 8, from verse 10 to 12, it talks about the anointing as well. Anointed and consecrated, amplified translation always says, anointed and consecrated. Say amen. And in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, let's go there. We're looking at anointing. <laughs> And we look at Jesus' anointing, and then we can look at the believer's anointing. Can I hear an amen? amen. How many of you know believers are anointed? Aha. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's what we're studying today. But we just want to introduce that by saying what the Jews thought of anointing. Acts 10.38, I think it is. It says, how God anointed, that's why I said Amplified, says anointed and consecrated. How God anointed and consecrated Jesus of Nazareth with what? the Holy Spirit, and with strength and ability and power, how he went about doing what? Good, and in particular, curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil, for God was with him. Can I hear an amen? How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with what? Power. Who went about doing good, healing all the oppressed. That's very clear. Number one, God anointed him. Number two, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And with what? Power. 
Anoint just means rub off on. So God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power, and Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were what? Oppressed of the devil. So you appreciate when um, Peter, in Matthew 16, when Jesus said, who do people say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. Now you should understand that. Now you understand it better if you have not. It means that he's saying you are the Messiah. The anointed one and his anointing. Can I hear an amen? So in the Greek, in the Hebrew, is Messiah. In the Greek, is Christ. Same word. Say amen. Christos. You are the Messiah. That's why he turned around and said, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Then he went on to say, and upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. I want you to understand that in the Old Testament, the presence of enemies and the presence of opposition was a constant issue with most, most of them. So their cry to God was always to deliver them from an enemy. Is that not true? Yeah. So you must understand that the anointing is designed to overcome something. Amen. Did you catch what I'm saying? The anointing is designed to do what? Overcome something. Now, in the New Testament, we, I mean, in our own days now, like in this country, you may not have a physical enemy that is up against you, but I know, I want you to know that witches and covens of witchcraft and all that around you, they're not exactly happy that you are happy clappy. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? They're not, they're, not, they're not having a cup of tea rejoicing over the fact that you are reading the Bible. Hello? Yeah. If they can close down all churches available, they will. How many of you know that? So, in case you think, well, we have no physical enemies now, well, I'll give you some secrets. Some of the works of your flesh, they are your enemies. And they are all designed to accomplish the works of darkness. Am I talking here? So, apart from the, 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 the how many of you know that there are many witches' covens around, 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 in this whole country? Did you hear me? How many of you know that they would love for all churches to close, and the ones that are open should do nothing spiritual? Talk to me. Do nothing spiritual. Just come together and raise money to send food to somebody. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not the whole purpose why the church was born. When I hear an amen. I mean, in this country right now, if you want to be a good church, just feed the poor. Don't pray, just feed the poor. You'll be wonderful. Don't you think so? Yes. And nothing wrong with feeding the poor. God wants us to feed the poor, don't get me wrong. But if that's all we do, then you can have many of us feeding all the poor. Say amen. But I'm telling you that God anoints for a purpose. And you are anointed for a purpose. I said you are anointed for a purpose. I said you are anointed for a purpose. So let's get that straight. That in the Old Testament, the priests were anointed, the kings were anointed, the prophets were anointed, and they had a purpose. They came to govern, they came to overcome the opposition, they came to establish the will of God, they came to do so many things, and they were called for that purpose, and they were anointed for that purpose. Now what is missing is that many believers still do not believe that they have a ministry. Say amen. How many of you know you have a ministry? You better believe it. That's why I say you should listen. That you are called... Remember, all of us are called to fellowship with God. Say amen. So there's a calling upon your life. Say amen. amen. Then there's an anointing upon your life. That anointing does not make you a preacher, although you should preach. Say amen. It doesn't make you a prophet, although you should be activated prophetically. <laughs> it doesn't make you an apostle, although you should have grace to break new grounds. Am I talking here? Because if you really want to understand the believer's anointing, we should look at it from its whole ramification. First of all, from the Old Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, the ordinary Jew was not anointed, although, having said that, when he was telling them not to touch his anointed, he was referring to the whole nation. Is that not true? That means that there was a representative anointing upon the whole nation. Can I hear an amen? So, we need to understand that God operates by his anointing. Say aloud, loud Amen. Now, when Samson, how many of you think Samson, the guy who killed a thousand people, Midianites and what have you, with the jawbone of an ass, how many of you think he was well built up and he went to the gym to do exercise? How many of you think so? No. 
The Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him. You get the point I'm making. The Spirit of God did what? Came upon him. A new strength came upon him. If he was that strong, they would know from afar and run from him. Is that not true? But he looked like an ordinary person until the Spirit of God came upon him. Can I hear an amen? That's what makes it outstanding. He looked like an ordinary person. But when the Spirit of God will come upon him, the Spirit of might will be made manifest. And then Samson will do exploits for God. And as soon as he finishes, you will see a normal human being again. Say amen. So you need to capture that at the back of your mind when we talk about the anointing because there are different purposes of the anointing. Hallelujah. All right, so you've understood that. Now, is it true that the New Testament believer is also anointed? Well, let's ask ourselves an answer from the Bible. 1 John chapter 2. In verse 20, it says, For you have been anointed... You hold a sacred appointment from, you have been given an unction from the Holy One, and you know, or you all know the truth, or you know all things. Does, does that mean you are anointed truly, or is talking to somebody else? Talk to me. Let me open it from my other easier translation. It says from verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Is it true? Talk to me now. So let's read the context and know who he's talking to, that you have an anointing. Let's take him on verse 15. Okay, let's take him on verse 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him from who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. Can I say amen? And, I, and you have overcome the wicked one. I remember one of the churches I preached in, the son of one of the pastors said, why is he always saying amen? I said, that's my style. I learned it from those who taught me to preach. Say amen. amen. At least to make sure you are not sleeping on me. Say Amen. amen. Can I hear it on this side? Can I hear it on that side? Okay, so you are with me. It says, (laughs) the son came to meet the dad. So why is he always saying, say amen? So I took note that because it's something I wasn't conscious I was doing. So now I'm conscious of it. Okay, so it says, I've written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because, because you are strong. Now he's talking about natural fathers and natural young men, but you can also take it spiritually too. Can I hear an amen? That young men should be strong and the word of God should abide in them. Can I hear an amen? amen? And what is the secret? And you have overcome the wicked one. I like that. If the word of God abides in you, you have overcome the wicked one because that's what the word of God tells you. Verse 15, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So these guys are now discussing. They've discussed the things that they have written to them. They've told them why they have written these things to them. Because they know the Father, because they have known him from the beginning, and because they are strong on the word of Christ. He's now advising them. He says, do not love the world. Is that not an interesting story? That, he's not talking about the world as the people in the world, but the world as the systems that govern the world. You should understand the difference. And he breaks it down. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, these are the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and what? The pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of, this, of the world. So all the marketing, all the entertainment, all the things that make this world what it is, is born out of these three things. Say with me, the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Let me just break it down in case somebody is here today hearing this for the first time. The lust of the flesh, or the lust of the flesh is, or of the eyes, is when you see something and you desire it at all costs. Hello. That's where marketing comes in. They make you feel like you've not worn a pair of shoes until you wear this particular one. Hello. How many of you know that's how marketing works? When you're driving your car, it's like, that car is no good until you drive this one. Is that not true? Now, these are the lusts of the eyes. They are, 
that they're used for, marketers use this for marketing purposes. And so we've come to accept it as that's the way the world is. Is that not true? But it takes what you see, apply, appealing to what you desire. What about the lust of the flesh? What is it? What your humanity desires, your carnal human flesh, what it wants. Some of it is legitimate, don't get me wrong. But that lust, that strong, I think the word lust is the key here, the strong desire. It's like if I see a new pair of shoes and if I don't get it, I'm not happy. That's lust of the eyes. Hello. Lust of the flesh is a strong desire to fulfill the desires of the flesh. All of them play right into the hands of the enemy who is the God of this world who uses that to lure people away from God. That's what this is telling you and I. Love not the world. Anyone who has the love of the world, the love of the Father is not in that person. In other words, the proof of the love of the Father being in you is that the love of the world is not there. And the love of the world is plenty. Pride of life, what does it mean? It means I take my sense of significance from my achievements. Is that not something we all do? We take our sense of achievement, our sense of significance from our possession, our achievements, our identity, and that's, man, that's pride of life. So if, you don't, if I didn't break it down now, we all think we know what he's talking about. And this can be extended into so many things that we do. These are the things that govern the world. They govern politics, they govern uh, entertainment, they govern everything that you do. Is that not true? The, I mean, that's what we do. So what does that tell me? It tells me that if I don't have a fellowship with God, the love of the world is already inside me. And to let you know how real it is, if you look at Genesis' account of Adam and Eve, what did they use to tempt Adam and Eve? This apple or this fruit, it's not an apple, this fruit that God says of the knowledge of good and evil you shouldn't eat. The enemy came and said, wow, if God knows the day you eat it, you will be wise. He planted a seed in the mind of Eve, and the Bible says Eve looked at it and saw that it was good for food. So you can trace the three things that Satan uses in the world to Eve and Adam. Loss of the flesh, loss of the eyes, and what? You will be wise, pride of life. Desires to be good, good for your flesh. She's looked at it, lost of the eyes. You thought that was all. Look at the temptation of Jesus Christ. The same thing. Jesus was hungry. If you be the son of God, turn the stone into bread. Man, you've been fasting for 40 days. For heaven's sake, a stone becoming bread food that you can break your fast is not too bad, is it? But it was a temptation because it was the lost of the eyes, of the flesh, sorry. Am I talking here? It carried him up. It said, look at all the world and its glories. You know what he was showing him? The wealth of the world. It says, it is mine to give whosoever I want. All I want you to do is just bow down and worship me. And it will be yours. Hello, somebody. How many of you know that proposal is still going on today? All these things that we're reading and talking about, they're still on today. We're talking about the current situation. If you will just look away, we'll make you the CEO of this country, of this company. Bow down and worship me. I'll give it to you. Hello, somebody. Lost of the eyes. He looked at it and said, no, I will worship no other but God Almighty. Do you know that when Jesus said that, he knew he was going to the cross? Did you hear me? He knew he was going where? Directly opposite to what he was offered. And you see, if you look at it in the natural, what does it take? Just say, okay, Satan, I bow to you. I'll repent later. <laughs> smart Alex. You know, some of us are so smart. <laughs> You know, say, I bow to you, but I'll repent later. Just give me this world. Now, you see, you cannot let go of the world. Hello, somebody. I was preaching somewhere. I said, what you're not ready to die to, you're not ready to have. Do, 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 do. That's what Jesus demonstrated. What about when he told him, cast yourself down? Now he quoted scripture to him. Did he not say he would give his angels charge over you? You know what he was appealing to? Pride of life. And he said, you will not tempt the Lord your God. Thank God that Jesus has been feeding on the word from age 12 or so as a Jew. He was quoting Old Testament scriptures back at him. Amen, somebody. Are those temptations still available? 
my brother, my sister, you better believe it. That the ability to overcome those temptations is the first reason for the anointing. Is someone hearing me? That's the first reason for the anointing. 